Thank you, to Asia Society, um, for the experience of being an Australia Korea Fellow over the past year. It's been a really gratifying experience. And I'm also very honoured to have such esteemed panellists um, to discuss my policy memo and um, also such a great moderate, moderator today. And thanks again um, also to the audience um, who's with us today. Um, so I just want to briefly um, give a recap of my policy memo. Um, it starts with the idea that we have an outgoing South Korean president um, who basically focused his foreign policy very much on the North Korea problem. And he devoted almost unprecedented whole of government resources um, to dealing with um, North Korea and to trying to establish a better relationship and to also de-escalate tensions on the Korean peninsula. And of course, we've seen many Korean presidents with engagement policies in the past, but what was quite unique about President Moon's policy is that he didn't regard denuclearization as the starting point or, or as, a, as a sort of, you know, condition for offering any other um, sort of concessions in the relationship, but really regarded the improvement of inter-Korea relations um, and promoted economic engagement with North Korea as a kind of almost a, a precondition to denuclearization. So this is a reversal of um, the, the US approach, which always um, puts denuclearization first and regards such, thing as, such things as economic assistance um, as concessions that North Korea has to earn. Um, but we see that there's been very little um, that Moon has been able to ultimately achieve in terms of both um, de-escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula and there's really been no move towards denuclearization. At best, he helped to broker, along with the United States, a pause in North Korea's um, nuclear weapons program or, or at least its, it's um, intercontinental ballistic missile testing, um, which has now resumed. Um, the other unique aspect of Moon's um, policy, or oh, really his term as president, is that we saw the advent of a new diplomatic approach, which was a move away from the, the previous um, multilateral um, diplomatic engagement with North Korea through the six-party talks to um, what we could call summit, summit diplomacy, um, high-level meetings um, between leaders around the region with um, Kim Jong-un. So we can now reflect on that, that it, it didn't necessarily offer anything more than the six-party talks, which were hampered by the, the differential emphasis the, the various parties placed on denuclearization in their overall new North Korea policy. And basically we saw the, the weakness of the summit talks um, was that North Korea was essentially able to elicit concessions um, from his summit partners and also to play the summits off against other um, summits <laughs> within the region. So he really held the upper hand in those meetings. And the other issue was that Japan was missing from this summit tree. And that's a problem because Japan is obviously, um, as a sworn enemy of the North Korean regime, part of the strategic equation in dealing with North Korea. And it's, it's really inconceivable that North Korea would take any steps towards denuclearization if it didn't have certain security assurances from Japan. Um, so just to start winding up, we now have a new Korean president, an incoming president, President Yoon, who promises to swing back towards, away from this engagement approach to a, a policy of isolation. Again, there's nothing new here. We've seen it's it's kind of become a pattern that the progressive um, governments in South Korea favour engagement, the conservative parties um, favour um, basically isolation, um, really two ends of the extreme. And this thing we see because of the, the two-party system Korea has, we, we see a swing, you know, a kind of policy pendulum swing between these two extremes. And the problem with this is that Often there's, there's, there's advantages to both approaches, there's disadvantages to both approaches, but really the biggest problem here is the lack of continuity of foreign policy. Um, you know, I, I can't help thinking that, that what is needed is not so much a, a new approach to North Korea, but the sort of 
policy continuity that we saw when back in 1946 when George Kennan wrote, wrote a long telegram um, that really became the basis for the containment policy of Russia that was very enduring over decades and he managed to um, convince a lot of other countries in the region um, to, to basically stick to that policy for a very long time. Um, and I also think the, the problems that Yun is going to face is he's, he's talking about aligning um, his policy with the US. Um, he's going to you know, put denuclearization first. But again, we've seen that that's very difficult because the US and South Korea have completely different conceptions of how de denuclearization should unfold. We've seen that in the past, so that will be a challenge. Also, um, it's going to be very difficult for him to bring Japan into the equation, as he hopes to do and the US hopes he'll do. Um, that's because of persistent history problems, which we may talk about later in the session. And also the US is obviously going to be quite preoccupied with, um, its conf with the conflict um, unfolding in Europe between Russia and Ukraine. And if that threatens to um, expand beyond that, um, beyond um, Ukraine into wider Europe, I think um, you can really forget about having very strong support um, from the US. And lastly, um, he also promises to be a bit more hawkish towards China. And again, this is just going to mean that North Korea really has the upper hand because North Korea will exploit, you know, what will obviously be a, a deterioration between um, China and South Korea. Um, there'll be probably a persistent deterioration between Japan and South Korea, and the US is, is really going to be preoccupied elsewhere. So I think Yun uh, may be setting himself up for um, what looks like uh, could possibly be um, much, much more in terms of tensions on the Korean Peninsula and North Korea may very well feel emboldened um, to really push ahead with its nuclear weapons program as, as we're seeing already. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I'll take it from here. Uh, thanks for having me, Asia Society, here as a moderator today. Lauren, you're right. I think that UN administration has a mounting international relations challenges ahead, especially with the Ukraine crisis and North Korea also aligning very closely with China and Russia amid the security crisis in Europe. Um, on that note, I think we should reflect on the elections for a bit. Maybe this is for Sung Ho. Uh, there's a lot of domestic issues at the core of the election period, housing, employment, feminism, anti-feminism, et cetera. And amid all these, what can be said about how South Korea views foreign policy outside the North Korea thread? Is foreign policy high on the agenda for South Korea and, the, and its people, or is it not? Thank you. Um, I think in general, every politics is uh, local, right? So I think Korea, South Korea was not the exception, in particular in this election, I guess. Always, yes, North Koreans uh, tend to be on the high uh, on the agenda for any government and any election. But I guess this year uh, in particular, I see in a way the uh, foreign policy was really quite uh, you know, low on the agenda. Instead, uh, as you pointed out, lots of uh, especially domestic economic issues such as uh, high rising uh, ho housing costs or use of unemployment or the, especially the gender issue uh, in the you know, young uh, in the male versus female, those social issue and uh, economic issue was the main agenda and the point of debate in this election in particular. I think one of the reason is because uh, under the <clears throat> current uh, government, uh, <clears throat> the North Korean issue has been largely stabilized at least. Yes, there was not uh, much big uh, progress in the denuclearization, but at least inter-Korean relations or the in general the North Korean uh, military provocation was uh, kept under the kind of rock. So there was another uh, maybe region that uh, foreign policy was not such a big issue. And also in general, Korea-US alliance was also in very good, you know, uh, uh, strong standing. There was another, I guess, uh, region. 
Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Moon administration made some uh, de developments in, in the U.S.-South Korea relations, especially last year in May when they held a summit with uh, President Biden. Uh, let me turn to you, Lauren, for a while. Building on from this, is there any space for more security cooperation under the new South Korea-Australia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership? Or is the bilateral relationship likely to take a backseat in the next five years with a lot of issues going on in the region? Yeah, so this Comprehensive Strategic Partnership was obviously an important step forward um, in the Australia-Korea relation. Um, relationship, which has been on a, a fairly steady trajectory towards deepening institutionalization. Um, it's important to realize that regardless of who the South Korean president is, um, there's, there's many partners um, for South Korea that are always going to be more important than Australia. Obviously, the US, China, even Japan, um, despite the, the adversarial <laughs> nature of their relationship of late. Um, and also President Moon sort of had a preference for even Southeast Asia. So Australia is pretty, is, is lower on the foreign policy radar. Um, I expect that will continue, but as we saw towards the end of the Moon um, presidency, Australia has slightly moved up in the ranks of importance. Um, and I expect this to continue, especially if, you know, President Yoon does pursue this harsh, um, hawkish foreign policy toward China that will obviously provide sort of, um, I guess, more impetus for <laughs> South Korea and Australia to work together. Um, and also if Yoon um, takes more of a strategic position in the Indo-Pacific, something that President Moon was quite unwilling to do. Um, but that being said, I still think the limits of our security cooperation will be um, sort of will, will remain. Um, firstly, I, I don't see Australia playing a big role in helping South Korea with its biggest security problem, which is, is North Korea. We'd be more likely to work together in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but I think Yoon's um, policy there will, will still probably be limited. It depends, of course, on to what extent North Korea ramps up its provocations. Um, if it really continues in the vein it is, that is again going to detract um, from the South Korean pre president developing other partnerships in the region, which is something that Moon was really hampered by. A lot of people believe that he focused on North Korea um, at the expense of many other, you know, potential and, and also important um, partners in the region. Thank you, Lauren. Just a very quick follow-up question. Quad issue and AUKUS issue. Um, these two were also one of the main uh, talking points during the election season. Um, under UN administration, will South Korea consider joining these seriously or will Quad and AUKUS actually be interested in having South Korea? Yeah, well, I mean, President Yoon is is basically, sounds like he's quite keen to join, you know, the Quad, especially on issues, sort of non-traditional security related issues, you know, issues, more issues of global governance and things like that. Um, but there is, again, the problem of firstly, it, it is a Quad, okay, so maybe consider him as part of a, a Quad Plus. Um, but then I expect there will be resistance from Japan, um, who was obviously really well, the architect of the Quad. Japan worries, you know, um, that if South Korea is to join, that the Quad will not be able to come up with coherent sort of policy lines on China. Um, so, of course, Yun is, you know, promising to be a bit more hawkish towards China, but That'll be a case of, I think, wait and see. You know, it's, it's easy to make those statements, but he may very well decide that, you know, China's important for dealing with North Korea, as, as Moon did. Um, so, yeah, I don't really think it's, it's that feasible unless Japan and South Korea can improve their relations. We, we see even with the, the four quad members that um, they couldn't come up on a coherent statement on um, Russia because of India's position. So, 
Right. Qua is already going through some challenges internally already. Let me come back to this issue because I want to hear um, Song Ho's thoughts on this as well. I'll move to Justin now. Um, I, I, I think we should discuss the prospect of inter-Korean cooperation for a while. Uh, Justin, South Korea's president-elect Yoon has a widely different view on the conditions of inter-Korean cooperation with President Moon, but the two Koreas still have a few areas of cooperation despite the division and differences. And what do you think are the areas of cooperation that still remains and what's the role of non-state actors, perhaps, in peace building? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think part of the, the problem for, um, for South Korea in terms of sort of developing cooperation with North Korea is, is ultimately it's up, what, is, what does North Korea want out of, this, of these cooperations, right? Uh, and, you know, if we're saying, well, what kinds of cooperation could North Korea and South Korea have? In, in a way that sort of expands across different political administrations in South Korea, we're talking about things that ultimately will be a benefit to North Korea, but also will not be seen as particularly provocative in South Korea, right? So we'll see things like environmental cooperation, right? So South North Korea uh, desperately needs to reforest after a sort of deforestation over decades um, due to sort of environmental degradation. Uh, it sort of needs to develop its economy. So sort of, you know, cooperation in, uh, economic development, even something as basic as entrepreneurship classes and uh, sort of classes in attracting investment. Um, obviously, these things are limited by the political environment in South Korea, um, as well as by, by, you know, in some sense, by sanctions, depending on what, you're, what you need. Um, but I think one of the things to keep in mind is that North Korea is um, often willing to cooperate on sort of many issues that it views as beneficial to itself, even during periods when there is political um, conflict, right? Um, and to, you know, sort of Interestingly, I think sort of the main inhibitor in cooperation between North and South Korea um, in the past couple of years has not been any particular conflict or policy of South Korea. It's been COVID, right? Uh, and, you know, COVID and South, North Korea basically shutting itself off from the rest of the world to keep COVID out um, from their perspective. Uh, and that's the main inhibitor, not, not sort of South Korean policy, right? Um, and so the question, you know, to a certain extent is how can North Korea and South Korea cooperate? It's going to depend a lot on, on how North Korea sort of, you know, basically views its own policies towards COVID going forward. Right. They have been maintaining a very draconian measure, closing down the border um, and the, 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 the shoot to uh, fire firing area, the buffer zone area at the, at the, at the China North Korea border. Actually, I have a follow up question to Song Ho on this. Let's say that COVID ended. Um, and under Yoon administration, do you think there's any prospects for inter-Korean cooperation? Because Yoon um, conditions any inter-Korean cooperation, meaningful inter-Korean cooperation on North Korea's denuclearization progress. I think in that sense, <clears throat> again, I uh, agree with uh, what Justin just said. It's not up to South Korean uh, COVID situation. It is up to North Korean COVID situation. And uh, given this, you know, <clears throat> kind of report that I guess uh, North Korea doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't have that kind of nationwide, you know, the vaccine uh, policy. They, uh, instead, they just c completely shut down the you know, whole country, right? That's the only way they could keep the, you know, uh, the vaccine and uh, the pandemic uh, COVID from spreading into its general population. In that situation, even if there's an end of you know, COVID in South Korea, that doesn't <clears throat> provide enough condition for North Korea to interact at least people to people level in economic exchange, et cetera. So it's a kind of still, I, I see it's, it's gonna be quite difficult for North Korean to uh, engage with South Korea, especially, and also <clears throat> I don't think uh, UN administration will you know, for emphasis, priority, uh, um, emphasis on the inter-Korean, you know, engagement. As uh, Loren laid out, you uh, promised to take a much tougher policy, uh, focusing more on denuclearization. And that kind of uh, policy, I think probably only backfire uh, from the North Korean position. As we already know, there's a kind of movement or observation that North Korea may try to, you know, restart this uh, uh, ICBM test or even the nuclear test in coming months. If that's the case, I think uh, the inter-Korean relation uh, in general or situation on the Korean Peninsula, maybe the, it's the case of uh, you know, tension will escalate as opposed to de-escalation of tension, which is uh, important for inter-Korean engagement. 
I agree. I agree. Um, and, and speaking of COVID, I think uh, I, I'll return to Justin for a bit. The ongoing COVID, uh, COVID-19 pandemic did show that North Korea is not as isolated from the rest of the world as many think, as in fact, relying on important goods, especially from China. And knowing this, do you think um, stricter sanctions will be um, helpful, likely to have the intended impact, or will it draw retaliation? Um, in, in, just in general, do you think sanctions will work under the COVID-19 situation and with North Korea vetoing the UNSC resolution um, decision on, on, on con- condemning Russia and so on and so forth? Well, I, I guess the question is, well, what are sanctions supposed to be doing at this point? Right? I mean, we, we can sort of conclude that, you know, that at some point sanctions have diminishing marginal returns in what they can accomplish, uh, particularly in terms of, of you know, getting a country to, to reverse a position already had. Right? And so, I mean, that's something we, we sort of genuinely need to question. Uh, North Korea's economy, as it's set up, is um, very good at getting around a lot of the sanctions, not all of them. Uh, they don't have sort of, they're not, you know, indefinitely uh, adaptable. Um, but, you know, the, the corollary of this is by getting around the sanctions, they are quite dependent on on trade with the rest of the world. Right? I mean, sort of goods that are in North Korean markets come from outside of North Korea. Um, they've they've tried to replace some of them, but they still need the raw materials to actually do that. Right. Sort of the shipments that North Korea makes money on of coal and, and iron and things like that, awfully have to be smuggled out to get around sanctions. Right. So so in that sense, they are quite dependent. Um, and they've they've tried to maintain at least a lot of that trade by sea, even during the COVID shutdown. Right. So sort of recall sort of in some sense, the, the economy that North Korea has right now that's struggling is largely due to the COVID um, border closures, not due to, to the sanctions. Right. Um, and so what that means in some sense is North Korea is destroying its own economy right now, not not the sanctions as such. Um, and with that said, we wouldn't expect it to sort of um, blossom again if once you know COVID goes away. Right. Um, I, I think, you know, in some sense, North Korea has adapted um, pretty much indefinitely to sanctions as they exist. They would prefer that they go away. Um, they are sort of hurting Kim Jong Un's um, political standing within North Korea. Um, but you know, sort of in terms of what else can we do, I think there's not much else that can be done. Right. I mean, sort of really, sort of what uh, what will affect North Korea is how much China enforces the sanctions. Uh, and sort of North Korea has probably made the calculation that um, you know China will not enforce the sanctions particularly strictly as long as there are no provocations. Um, which has been what's happening over the past you know, four years. Uh, will this change with the ICBM tests, if there is one? I mean, we'll see, I guess. Um, but you know, we, we have to keep in mind with the ICBM tests and other things like that, that ultimately North Korea tests things not only to um, send signals to the US and China and other countries, but also because they want to see if the, the missiles work, right? Um, and, you know, and so you know, this is, you know, it's, not, it's not a signal so much as an actual um, sort of ongoing program of developing their, their capabilities. Just for a context for anyone unfamiliar, North Korea tested a projectile yesterday, which uh, reportedly, according to South Korean military, blew up upon launching. Um, and actually, a follow-up question for you, Justin. You mentioned provocation in China. What do you think China's perception of red line is? Do you think ICBM system test or satellite system test would also provoke China, or is that something else, like nuclear test by North Korea? Well, I, I certainly think an actual nuclear test would provoke China, um, you know, you know, China hasn't really elicited any uh, have, having any explicit red lines with North Korea. Um, but, you know, they you know, we can see what the red lines are when, when they agree to sanctions in the United Nations. Generally, that's uh, an ICBM test or a um, or a nuclear weapons test. Um, so, you know, certainly we can see that China might do this at the same time. In the past couple of years, China has questioned the need for further sanctions and sort of suggests that maybe sanctions being wound back as a way to get North Korea back to the the bargaining table, right? So if there was an ICBM test, um, we'll be interested to see what China does, right? Um, it may simply keep the sanctions as is and then just enforce the, the border uh, more strictly, um, you know, but you know, North Korea is doing that by itself right now, right? So I, I think, you know, sort of in, in some sense, the whole Russia-Ukraine conflict has actually thrown a lot of these calculations um, off kilter with regard to what China will do about North Korea. Um, you know, sort of China has now another headache to deal with. They don't really want a headache in North Korea as well. And, you know, at the same time, you know, sort of Russia invading Ukraine, lest we forget, has probably put a, a stopper in North Korea ever denuclearizing, right? Because it suggests that if you, if you get rid of your nuclear weapons, what will happen is a nuclear weapon state will, can invade you, right? And, you know, this has nothing to do with the U.S. This is sort of now what, what Russia has done to Ukraine. So, so in some sense, you know, sort of denuclearization has been set back a lot by, by sort of the, the, the existence of the Ukraine conflict.
Lauren, any comment on this on Ukraine, Russia, China, South Korea, North Korea conundrum? Yeah, well, I just sort of think, you know, when you you look from a a historical perspective um, under the Cold War, when the the United States first, you know, confronted um, the Soviet Union threat, it's it's sort of policy was to create this trilateral arrangement of deterrence with South Korea and Japan. And this was to offset the the trilateral arrangement that was forming between um, Russia, China and North Korea. Um, What kind of worries me today, just looking at the current context with this conflict um, unfolding, is that the US trilateral, you know, traditional trilateral arrangement of deterrence is severely weakened. And I don't see that improving. Um, And at the same time, we see these, these old, you know, sort of, alliances between China, Russia, North Korea, um, in some ways looking looking stronger. Um, and I think I, I'm assuming that Yoon President, incoming President Yoon doesn't really have a, a really good understanding of foreign policy and the history of it, how it works, and he's probably not too concerned, but I think he should be very concerned about the state of the relationship with Japan um, and, the, yeah, that, that traditional um, deterrent triangle. Uh, Yoon, during the campaign trail, did mention a couple of times that he will be prioritizing more cooperation with Japan. But we'll see because we were yet to see the full uh, list of who will be Yoon's foreign policy advisors um, with the transition committee um, on the rise. I'll, uh, um, back to Song Ho um, on U.S.-South Korea relations for a little bit. Uh, President Biden has a more traditional and stricter stance towards North Korea than his predecessor. And um, some experts do say that his policy reflects a return to Obama's strategic patience policy. And um, under this uh, situation, two questions. First, how do you think Biden views the peace building role in the Korean Peninsula? And second, how will the new South Korean administration impact the U.S. South Korea relationship? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the one thing uh, I think quite clear is that, uh, you know, another crisis popping up in, on the Korean Peninsula is the last thing that Biden administration or Chinese, the Xi Jinping, wants to see. That's for sure. I mean, they already have a you know, headache in the Ukraine other than US-China, you know, rivalry and competition. So I guess <clears throat> in this sense, uh, maybe, you know, uh, the inter-Korean relation or North Korea uh, keep uh, quiet on its nuclear front and that, that's what may be kind of more important for Biden. And, but obviously, the United States has been pursuing this uh, denuclearization policy as well. So in that regard, uh, you are right. Uh, the Biden uh, has taken much more principled approach when it comes to nuclear negotiation with North Korea. And, but at the same time, uh, under the, the, the previous Moon Jae-in government, the Moon was uh, trying to you know, engage North Korea more. While at the same time, by the way, on the moon, South Korean defense buildup has, you know, also gone quite uh, remarkably. In fact, uh, he invested lots of money on defense building up and deterrence capability against North Korean uh, military provocation. So in a way, it was a kind of play of uh, good cop, bad cop. Uh, the South Korean moon uh, playing more of a good cop, whereas uh, uh, President Biden playing a kind of a traditional bad cop approach when it comes to nuclear negotiation. But I guess uh, under the current uh, newly developing situation in Ukraine and the Biden, obviously, and his American public, they want to see focusing on economic rebuilding of American economy and middle class. They want to focus on their own domestic issue in terms of political polarization and, you know, coming midterm election in November. So I don't think uh, Biden has any appetite to have another crisis on the Korean Peninsula. So in this case, Biden will try to still, uh, uh, you know, play very careful uh, in, in, in dealing with the North Korean situation. But the concern is if uh, Yoon, unlike the Moon, you know, take that kind of uh, hardline policy towards North Korea. Again, okay, like I said, uh, North Korea will come up with another kind of uh, of the anti, such as ICBM test and nuclear test. Then you have uh, 
another you know, crisis situation on the Korean Peninsula. So Biden himself will find it's in a kind of awkward position. Uh, on one hand, he has to you know, work very closely with the Yoon, who plans to rebuild the U.S. out of KLIs. But at the same time, he will be in the position to try to kind of uh, you know, uh, stabilize the situation on the Korean Peninsula. So maybe this time the, the uh, role will be reversing the South Korean government playing more of a bad card, whereas uh, Biden <laughs> has to play some kind of uh, you know, at least a stabilizer or good cop role in dealing with the North Korean situation. We will see how it goes. The good cop, bad cop scenario is interesting, especially with Yoon going from a more charismatic uh, type of leadership image compared to Moon. And you're right, the defense budget was very high, but it seems it's going to continue. And Yoon has been being less careful about uh, tiptoeing around China, such as discussing thought issues as well. And United States might find itself in a very awkward position. Um, we are getting some questions from the floor, uh, from one from Jeffrey Robertson. Good morning, Jeffrey, uh, uh, about Australia and middle powers role. Um, how do the panelists see Australia and other middle power playing a role? They have never, they never have, um, except as supporters or major power interests, is it even possible? What can they do? Um, maybe this is for Lauren. Okay, sure. I'll have a go at this question. And um, hello to Jeff. Thanks um, very much for coming along. I think that the role that I, I sort of see emerging from Middle Palace here is, I mean, before in the region, in, in the Indo-Pacific region, we saw the rules-based order under threat, mostly because of China's actions. Um, but now we see it's a much more global issue um, with what's unfolding in Europe. Um, and this has become a more important agenda. And when you look at that against the backdrop of the Sino-US conflict, okay, I think those kind of great power rivalry, they're not so interested in so much in rules-based order issues. And I, I see this as an agenda for middle powers. Um, and I really hope, it's, I wrote a, a paper on this recently, that the Australian government will sort of take the opportunity of the new administrations in Japan and South Korea to try to bring those two, you know, together to, to certain, you know, diplomatic tables, not possibly not just the two of them, but including some other middle powers. I mean, some people dispute that Japan is a middle power, but um, and really to strengthen those ties and maybe look at, yeah, redefining or developing the rules-based order and looking at ways to strengthen those norms. I think that will be important. Uh, now that you mentioned Japan, actually, let me uh, get to the follow up question. Many say that the relationship between South Korea and Japan was at its lowest under the Moon and Abe administrations. And uh, now that there will be new leaders in, in both countries, the political landscape is likely to be shifting a lot. And uh, why do you think the relationship declined? And do you think Seoul and Tokyo can mend their relations? Can the two really put their historical differences aside to cooperate on defense and the region um, or the so-called two-track approach that UNIT Yoon is also mentioning? Um, and also, how is Japan approaching the denuclearization issue on the peninsula? Do you want me to address that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I think the reason why the relationship has been declining for a long time, but it, it sort of hit rock bottom in 2019, I mean, simply from a historical perspective, when the two countries normalised their relations in 1965, um, South Korea had an authoritarian regime. They signed a treaty that basically wrapped up or purported to wrap up all of the issues pertaining to colonialism, including you know issues relating to Korean victims. And ever since uh, South Korea embarked on democratisation, those victims have very gradually been rising up, um, trying to challenge that agreement. And they've over a very long process of trial and error that saw them litigating in Japan, the US, and now in South Korea, they've finally gained leverage over the diplomatic relationship. And we saw this in 2011 with the Korean Constitutional Court ruling on comfort women that basically insisted that the South Korean government needs to dispute the treaty with Japan. And then the reason things became so bad in 2019 is that the, the forced laborers, um, those who provided labor um, to Japan under um, the colonial period, 
um, basically, again, gained leverage um, by disputing the, the treaty and um, they kind of, in doing so, were able to undermine Japan's ac- economic interests in South Korea because the court ruled that, you know, um, Japan has to pay them. And because Japan wasn't going to abide by that ruling, the court thought, well, we'll take Japan's assets in Korea and we might liquidate them and give them to the laborers. So from Japan's perspective, this is just completely, you know, a complete sort of attack on the 1965 treaty that Japan still regards as, you know, the cornerstone of its foreign policy towards South Korea and history problems. So I don't see things improving under the new administrations because, as I alluded to, what's created so much of the friction in recent years has been these lawsuits. They're still going on, okay, and they're sort of expanding. We now see that the forced labor issue is not just about the matter of compensation, but Japan is trying to get UNESCO heritage status for certain sites in Japan that the laborers toiled in um, and doesn't want to acknowledge the role that those laborers played. So these disputes are unfolding in the UN. It's very hard to think how, like, to imagine that President Yoon could just ignore such issues when they really have such deep resonance in South Korean society. We're talking about the colonial period. Um, so I think what Japan is going to be waiting to see is what is President Yoon's position on the treaty and to what extent did it resolve those issues? And I think they'll be particularly eager to hear what he thinks about the 2015 Comfort Women Accord that um, President Moon dissolved. So, yeah, these issues are very tricky. And on denuclearization, I mean, Japan's North Korea policy is very odd. You know, they've been engaged in a very long-term engagement, I mean, isolation policy. And again, it's easy to have that policy continuity when you have the same party in rule for many, many years. Um, But really, I think the policy is mostly informed by the Japanese public. It's really geared towards appeasing, you know, the anti-North Korean constituents in Japan, which is basically most of Japan. It's more informed by the abduction issue, their thoughts on the abduction issue. I don't think there is an actual denuclearization policy in Japan that I've seen. The one thing I can say is traditionally when both Japan and North Korea uh, um, sort of coordinated in their policy on North Korea, like we're seeing a turn to isolation in both countries, that North Korea factor has acted as a glue for those two countries. It's kind of provided some incentives for them to try to manage their history problem. So that's the only positive indication I can see on the horizon with the UN administration in Japan. Thank you, Laura. And also there would be a domestic factor as well, because even during the campaign trail, the, the Lee camp was trying to frame Yoon, Yoon as someone who's uh, relatively pro-Japan. And Yoon winning with such a slim margin will be listening very carefully to the public opinion, whether or not it's the right timing to raise a Japan issue or not. Mm-hmm. And the South Korean public hatred towards China is actually rising a lot. So relatively, Japan's getting less attention. And speaking of China, we have a question from Nicholas Whitwell, um, says, could the panelists speak to the incoming prime minister's position and likely reaction to Chinese aggression towards Taiwan and how this factors into South Korea's foreign policy, please? Maybe Song Ho or Justin? I, mean, I, I could speak briefly to that, I guess. So, I mean... I think one of the, so I assume you're talking about the South Korean, incoming South Korean president um, in the question. Okay, so, I mean, I think one of the, the issues that South Korea had, as, as we've been alluded to before with joining the Quad, is that, you know, the Quad was, you know, regardless of what people say, was fundamentally centered around those countries in the Quad having a relatively similar approach to China, right? It's a, a similar wariness of Chinese power in, in, in the region, right? And, um, you know, South Korea, you know, has... As, as we've seen, you know, been very careful about China and its China policy in terms of how it balances that. Um, and so, you know, in terms of what South Korea would do about Taiwan, I mean, that, that might be in some sense a, a bridge too far. Um, you know, sort of Japan and the U.S. may be more willing to be more robust in their response. I mean, Australia might be more, more willing to be more robust in their response about their support of Taiwan to China. Um, but South Korea, you know, has traditionally been sort of less robust in the response about that. Um, partly because, you know, South Korean policy is largely has been focused mostly on North Korea and, and Taiwan is to a certain extent a, a distraction from that, I think. Um, well, you know, could that change under Yoon? 
I think it's too early to say how well formed his ideas on China and sort of what to do with China are. I guess we'll have to see. Um, I mean, that's something sort of that, that Sung Ho might, might know more about. Uh, Sung, do you want to? Yes, please. If I may also add to, uh, I think, uh, bottom line is uh, even though, I mean, you said a lot of things uh, during the campaign, right? But open for both, uh, any candidate, they tend to say things very simplistic terms. But once they got into office, I mean, the reality on the ground is uh, things are not that simple, right? So he may soon find that kind of reality and uh, he may have to adjust all those uh, policy campaign rhetoric. I guess uh, uh, not as, long, uh, as well as North Korea, but the China issue would be the case because uh, the, the, the reality for South Korea is Yes, our you know, the pillar of national security and foreign policy has been always U.S. or ROK alliance. Yet at the same time, maybe South Korea's economic pillar of economic growth and all that has been China predominantly. Plus that China is right next to us. I mean, even compared to Japan. So the, these things, and so that the China has a huge influence, not only in terms of economics, but also peninsula issue in dealing with North Korea, right? That's the reality that Yun has to face once he you know, starts to try to deal with. So I guess, uh, and the, 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 in that regard, I guess Korea may have a, 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 some difficult position in confronting China in many issues, including obviously Taiwan. Uh, that's a quite different uh, from the case of Japan. But also one other element is uh, historical legacy. I mean, Korean position regarding Taiwan could be in, a, in that sense, because Taiwan and all those uh, division of Korean Peninsula is uh, kind of originated from that uh, Japan's rise about centuries ago, and uh, it's a colonial past, right? So in that sense, uh, there's also some kind of, even though, yes, as you said, uh, recently after the South dispute with the uh, uh, Chinese heavy-handed policy towards South Korea, there was a kind of South Korean public opinion going very much negative on China recently. But yet at the same time, when it comes to those uh, geopolitical you know, dynamics and the historical issues, Korea's position regarding in dealing with China or Taiwan and Japan, a little bit is different from that of other uh, neighboring country, I should say. Uh, a follow-up question for you, Sang Ho. And in, in, in under that situation that you just described, um, what's going to happen to the, the, the architecture of the Indo-Pacific? And um, I said that we'll return to the question about Quad. Under that situation, um, is Yoon, how serious will the Yoon administration be about joining Quad Plus um, with uh, this awkward situation with China? Right. That's a, a very interesting question to see. And already there is a, some report, as you know, that the UN is try, uh, will maybe eventually uh, join the Quad Plus. I mean, not Quad, but Plus. But uh, I guess still, again, that we may have to wait and see. Uh, but it is clear that UN has a much uh, kind of a, a tougher uh, 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 you know, line and policy towards China and all that, in a sense that Yun will try to go back to the kind of traditional conservative basis of, you know, ROK US alliance is the central key. So we, we got to strengthen our alliance partnership. And in that uh, US national interest in China, US China strategic rivalry, if US want to have a stronger position in China, maybe we have to be on board. That's a kind of general frame of, of I guess, uh, uh, Yun's policy. So in that regard, maybe you uh, may be much willing to join the Quad, uh, along with Australia and in, in, in India. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not so sure that also depends on how China will react to those kinds of uh, uh, movement. And uh, in this regard, I guess already South Korea has been, on, even under the Moon administration, they've been trying to play a more kind of a role beyond the Korean Peninsula along with this, you know, uh, the United States and the other countries like Australia in building more of uh, uh, creating more peace and stability in the region in general, right? 
So, but that was, uh, they were very careful not to you know, uh, cross the line of, you know, confronting China in that uh, regard. Instead, they were focusing more on non-traditional traditional security issues such as. So we will see how Yun will go uh, you know, over those kind of delicate balancing act. And uh, let me also go back to the one question of what kind of middle power role is there, such as Australia and South Korea. I guess it's a, it cuts both ways. When there is a real direct and serious conflict of uh, interest between the superpowers, such as China and United States, when it comes to their strategic interests, I don't think there is a much role that we middle power can play. But at the same time, other than that, <clears throat> In other areas, uh, such as global you know, uh, climate change or pandemic and non-traditional security issues, I guess there is a quite a strong uh, you know, uh, uh, opportunity for us to play a certain role in, in, in between those superpowers. Yet at the same time right now, and also my last point is that USA and China is at the moment, they want to focus on their domestic issue at the moment. So there is not so much a great appetite for direct conflict between US China uh, per se. So maybe they provide some kind of another opportunity for middle power to get into and somehow you know, play a kind of a mediating role or bridging role or, 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 or shock observer between those two. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have another question, related question. Uh, it's another one from Jeffrey. Returning to Australia, how will a new Australian government differ in approach to the region in South Korea? Uh, Lauren, maybe? You're muted. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it, it's going to be quite an exciting year with the, the new um, governments all around. I mean, yeah, I think... China is kind of a, a bipartisan issue um, in Australia. So I expect that, you know, whoever um, we end up with um, in terms of the new government, that we're still going to be playing a, a pretty similar role in trying to, you know, shape Indo-Pacific policy, working together with Japan. And hopefully there will be an opening, you know, to strengthen the relationship between Australia and South Korea, which Jeff has written so much about, um, has always, you know, suffered um, from quite, quite a lot of neglect. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say um, at the moment if, if we're going to see any real change. I don't think there'll be the kind of swing in policy that we see when we have a regime change in South Korea. Um, but I'd be interested to hear if maybe Justin or, or someone else has a different perspective on that. Justin or Sung-ho, any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, yeah, the middle powers generally are going to have, um, you know, sort of the greatest sort of influence when they are focusing on, on, you know, the rules-based order, right? And, you know, sort of, again, that might be not as important in sort of strategic rivalry, but on, a, on an everyday basis, this becomes kind of important. We forget that sort of things have to keep on going um, in between the wars, right? So I, I think sort of that's, that's where, you know, a new Australian government, if there is one, could, could focus. I don't necessarily see a huge, um, a huge sort of change in, in Australian policy, regardless of who's in power. I mean, a lot of what Australia has done um, over the past number of years has, has been... I would argue, sort of largely driven by structural changes in the Indo-Pacific, um, and so, so in that sense, you know, we're going to see, you know, pretty much continuity that's, that's driven by the changing security environment in in the region. Uh, we're about to wrap up, so I will be uh, winding two questions, related questions together as a, a, a question to all panelists, actually. Uh, ben Westcott says, with the Moon presidency winding down, do you see it as a lost opportunity for peace or closer relations between the two Koreas? And do you expect there to be another chance under Yoon or future leaders on improving inter-Korean relations? And related uh, questions for everybody. In uh, Moon's final March 1st Independence Day speech recently, President Moon stated that peace on the peninsula is vital for South Korea to thrive in today's global dynamics where the great power competition is ongoing. What are your thoughts on this? And is peace realistic on the Korean peninsula? Uh, I'm asking for your final remark. Let's start with Song Ho. Yes. One thing is that, uh, unfortunately, the peace has been broken in the European continent with the Ukraine situation. 
But in general, on the, in the East, East Asia, on the Korean Peninsula, the peace has been, although quite you know, shaky, but there has been no major war on the Korean Peninsula. And I really wish as a Korean that will be the case for the next five years and the coming years. And that, uh, uh, but at the same time, I also wish that this uh, incoming new uh, UN administration will also try to engage with North Korea for the sake of real, really the peace on the Korean Peninsula. I mean, uh, if there is a war, what, what is, is meaningful, right? Uh, preemptive strike, all kinds of, you know, deploring another missile. I think that's the, the last thing that anybody from both North and South want to have a war on the Korea, second Korean war, right? And I, I think uh, that in that case, even the UN and the conservative base understand that kind of public mindset. And the, my uh, uh, last also point is that even under the previous uh, conservative government, there has been always effort to have a summit with the North Korean leadership on the Park Geun-hye in Lee Myung-bak. Simply, they didn't have a right kind of a momentum and some kind of condition to meet with. So I, I, I guess even with the very uh, tough rhetoric uh, with Yoon, Yoon still may be interested in meeting with Kim Jong-un and then and all that. And uh, quite right on it would be, because of this Yoon, maybe they could do some kind of Nixon moment uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un. So I wish that uh, will uh, that kind of engagement and meeting with the North Korean and the leader in diplomatic way could continue on the current government. But you know, the thing is, maybe that will come after some maybe crisis on the Korean Peninsula. We will see. Thank you. Knock on wood. Uh, we'll see. Uh, Justin, uh, any final comments? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think in, in some sense, the, you know, despite the, the missile tests, you know, the Korean Peninsula right now is, is not in too bad a position relative to what it's been in the past. Um, you know, is there a chance for peace? Well, I, I think what, you know, in some sense, or close relation between North and South Korea, I think in some sense, we need to ask, to what end? Like, what, what does South Korea want out of this? What does North Korea want out of it? Um, sort of proclaiming peace doesn't necessarily make the country reunify or anything like that, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I think sort of, in the long term, you know, you know, both countries really need to ask, well, what, what do you want? Will a summit do it? Will that help solve the problem? Or is there something deeper that, that they need to address? Um, and so, you know, if, I think if the past couple of years have taught us anything, is the summits themselves are, they, you know, they look good, they sort of great, they could move things forward, but they often don't, right? Um, and, you know, sort of the, re, the, the result is, you know, in some sense, a, a strategic stasis that we're seeing now. Thank you. Lauren, any final comment on peace on the Korean Peninsula? Yeah, I do actually um, think that, you know, the end of Moon's administration is a, a real kind of missed opportunity. I, I have that sense um, for the establishment of peace on the peninsula, not just because he wasn't able to broker a, a peace agreement, a peace treaty for the end of, to bring the Korean War to an end, um, but my own research in recent years has, has really sort of hammered home the point that none of these, this sort of history of aggression has been settled um, with North Korea. So you have, we talk a lot about the colonial victims in South Korea, and one could almost think that victimhood stops at the 38th parallel, but there's all the colonial victims in North Korea who are probably going to pass away without ever having received anything. And we also have, um, as I mentioned, there's the Korean War overlapping that. And my research in recent years has focused on the Koreans who were victims of the U.S. nuclear attacks in Japan. Um, two to 3,000 of them were sent back to North Korea. And they're the only A-bomb victims in the world that never got any redress. And again, they're still alive. And there's all these missed opportunities to end, you know, the suffering of not, we focus a lot on the North Korean regime, but for the people of North Korea, have never had any of those conflicts brought, brought to an end. And I think Moon was on the right track because it it took many years for North Korea to sort of develop this idea that it needs nuclear weapons and it's taken them many years to develop them and therefore it's going to take many years um, to achieve that peace. Sadly, it can't be squished into a five-year term. Um, and that's why I think that it wasn't just a failure of Moon to broker that peace, but the really unfortunate situation that his, his, his tenure coincided with Trump, you know, if it had been Obama, it could have looked different or, you know. Um, but I think Trump made a lot of mistakes and I think the US 
negotiators made a lot of mistakes in Hanoi by sort of changing their plan at the last minute and derailing things. So it's, it's not just North Korea that's made mistakes here. Um, I do think peace is possible. I think we have to believe in that. But sadly, it looks more and more like peace on the regime may include like North Korea continuing to possess um, nuclear weapons. I, I don't see them giving them up under any circumstances really anymore. Denuclearization and the unresolved issues since the colonialization, all these things uh, the UN administration will have to deal with in the next five years and, and even afterwards as well. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining our discussion today. Uh